Hi, my name is Drew and I'm going to be walking you through the Lance 2285 today. Uh, starting right up front here, we're going to cover how to uh, hook up. Yep, untangle this stuff here. So right up front here, we have your coupler, of course. As your coupler sits right now, it is actually in the unlocked position. So it has an automatic hold back uh, in that unlocked position. Uh, so the train of thought is from here, we would go ahead and raise the jack up three inches above the ball. We're gonna center ourselves underneath the coupler and then we're gonna of course lower the jack back down. We're, once we are fully seated, we're gonna go ahead and slide this locking tab forward. And what we're looking for there is full engagement of these vampire teeth uh, on the frame. So we want it just to sit uh, flush just like that. Uh, once we're locked on there, we're going to come down here and we're going to take our toe chains here. We're going to hook these onto the receiver. We're going to make sure that these toe chains are crossed underneath the coupler. And it is state law in Texas that these uh, toe chains cannot make contact with the pavement at any time. Riding right next to those toe chains, we're going to uh, have your emergency breakaway cable on a third connection point, again, riding uh, right next to those toe chains. Coming right up here to the uh, Lippert Smart Jack, uh, normal operation is going to be up or down on the jack, uh, very indicative of a electric tongue jack. Now what makes this a smart jack is it does automatically recall hitchhike memory as well as has a auto retract feature. To utilize either one of those features, you're going to go ahead and set them up using this sticker here on the side of the jack. Uh, common practice is going to be setting those up to the place where you're storing the unit, where you're going to be loading and unloading the unit the most. Uh, other than that, uh, again, up or down operation on the display here. They have a nice little battery monitor as well. Uh, you do have a halo light there on the underside. That's going to help light, uh, light this area if you are doing any coupling or uncoupling on, after dark as well as give you a point of reference again if you are backing up to the unit uh, after dark. Uh, also, part of your tow components is going to be your seven-way cord here. Uh, now this is going to plug directly into the bumper of your uh, tow vehicle. This is going to give you full function to the tow vehicle's uh, wiring or tow vehicle's lights, brakes, uh, things like that. Uh, directly behind there, we have three 20-pound propane tanks. These are going to be full for you today. Uh, you can run any two at a time. So uh, you have two hooked up and then one kind of here waiting in the wings. This one here all the way up front is going to be on a tension band. Uh, so you just tighten that tension band down. That's going to hold it into place. And then again, these two are utilizing a, a standard kind of T-bar connection there uh, to hold those tanks in place. Uh, to remove them for service, you're going to uh, loosen that oversized wing nut. Then you're going to go ahead and disconnect these pigtails here. You're going to slump that propane regulator off to the side, and then you'll have enough slack to go ahead and pull those out and get them serviced. Uh, in between the two tanks, you have an automatic switchover propane regulator. Uh, we're going to open this valve here and then directionalize it towards that tank. We're going to be drawing off of that tank initially. Now, if we go ahead and use all the propane that's in this tank and we have this valve on this second tank open, it's going to automatically switch over to that tank and start drawing off of that. Uh, now, if you don't want that automatic switch over feature uh, to happen, you do have to keep this secondary tank valve closed. At that point, you would then, uh, once this tank is empty, you would then go ahead, manually switch that over to this tank and go ahead and open this valve. You do have a flow indicator there on that regulator. It is a pinwheel style flow indicator. Uh, it is green when you have a, a flow of propane running through the line, and then it's going to pinwheel over to red when that tank is empty. All of this propane, these propane tanks in this area is going to be covered by your propane tank cover here. That's going to rest on these tracks here and then latch on top there. Uh, when that is in place, your access is going to be done from the door on the top. Uh, looks like you may have a little key on there. That's actually just a, a latch. So you can use a, a coin, uh, backside of a key, or, or your fingernail if, if you have uh, that option. But you can take that door off. You can turn your tanks on and off as needed. 
uh, doing any uh, switch over there of the regulator from that access panel on the top. Uh, coming around here to the side, uh, first up is going to be your battery door. Now the battery bank on this unit is made up of two group 24 deep cycle batteries. You have a, a door just like this on the other side uh, and it is, has a, a, the exact replica of this setup there. Uh, we lift up this locking tab to pull that battery out and that's going to expose your uh, deep cycle interstate battery here. Now this is a lead acid battery so what that means for you is two or three times a year we're going to go ahead and pull these vent panels and refill with distilled water as necessary. So there's a clear marked water level in there uh, in, beneath these panels and we do just want to maintain that water level throughout the year. Dropping down here, we have your uh, electric stabilizer jack panel. Now again, you have a door just like this uh, on the other side of the unit. Uh, only difference between this side and that side is going to be the lack of a power switch on the other side. So this driver side is right where you want to start. You're going to turn both sides on with this common power switch. And then we can go ahead and extend and retract those jacks. Uh, when you're coming down, utilizing that switch, once you make contact with the pavement, you want to stop immediately. Uh, same on the rear. It might be a little difficult to actually see uh, that jack when you're here uh, operating these switches. You can tell pretty clearly when it makes contact with the ground by the noise that the motor makes. So that motor is going to wind up. That's going to tell you that you have made contact with the pavement. Uh, stop as soon as you can. Uh, here in this compartment, a um, couple things. We have tap lights. So to light your compartment, it's just going to be a tap light and we're going to tap dead center there on that lens to go ahead and turn that light on and off. This switch here that's going to be for your LED lights that are on either side of the tongue. You have a, a, a short little LED strip. That's how we're going to turn those on. That's going to help further light that area if you are doing any maintenance after dark uh, or just kind of give you like a porch light kind of feel. We also have your battery disconnect switch here. Uh, as it sits right now with that, with that switch hanging out of the receptacle here, that would be the unlocked position or the, uh, the isolated position. When this key is removed, that battery is completely isolated. Those batteries are completely isolated from the unit. Uh, and essentially this does the same thing as physically disconnecting those batteries. Uh, we're going to disconnect those batteries or isolate those batteries anytime the unit's going to be in storage. Uh, long term. So general day-to-day -day use, there's going to be nominal or phantom draws, things running in the background of that 12 volt system that generally are no big deal. Uh, the problem happens is when you are in storage for many weeks, those, those, those small draws are going to compound themselves and take a toll on the battery. Anytime the unit's going to be in use, anytime you're going down the road, uh, anytime other than when the unit's in storage, this key needs to be inserted into that and uh, turned and locked in. So you know you're, you're on and you're ready to go if that key is inside, uh, is, is in there and locked in. Uh, other than that, here on the rear of this compartment, we have a three-quarter inch, uh, three inch lug wrench here. Now, three-quarter inch is a very common thread throughout the camper. Your uh, manual operation for your tongue jack is a three-quarter inch, which we didn't talk about that, but if you remove this panel here, that's going to expose a three-quarter inch drive nut. Uh, your lug nuts are three-quarter inch. Your spare tire gravity feed is going to be three-quarters of an inch. And so three-quarters of an inch, very common thread throughout the camper, uh, and, and that's a good thing. So the less tools you have to carry with you, the better. So coming down here, we have a a uh, little outside storage area, which is a really nice feature. That's not very deep. Um, so generally what I recommend my customers to use it for is uh, maybe your sewage components, like your uh, gloves, your elbows, things like that uh, will fit best in there. And of course, uh, you're not going to get too terribly much in there. Uh, so it's nice to have a place to store those uh, without, you know, away from your other things. Now coming down here, we have your dump valves. So you have gray for gray water and black for black water. Black water is going to be anything that comes from the toilet, your solid body waste, toilet paper, things like that. That's all going to be dumped here uh, utilizing the black tank valve there. 
Gray water is going to be sink water, shower water, relatively clean, cleaner of the two. And then you do have it separated by this bayonet style fitting here in the middle. Um, bayonet style fitting, your sewage hose is going to connect the very same way this cap comes off. You have four prongs along the outside of that tube. You're going to put your uh, sewage hose or your cap in the halfway position in between those prongs. Uh, turn it until it locks on, you're going to be connected. Now even when you are hooked up with a septic hose into full-time septic, you're going to keep this black tank, uh, black tank valve in the closed position. You're going to use the monitor panel on the inside and only dump as necessary. Reason being is we want to keep that solid body waste, that, uh, that those things that come from the toilet, we want that to keep in as wet or flowing condition as we can. That way it can easily evacuate the uh, toilet or the black water tank in this case and flow directly down the, the, the drain. Uh, a common option or a common, a popular option is going to be dumping your black tank first. When we're through dumping that black tank, we're going to go ahead and shut that black water valve. And then we're going to open up this gray water valve and allow that gray water to uh, rinse that black water further down the drain. Uh, goes without saying, these two valves should never be open at the same time. We want to avoid any, uh, any, any back feeding or cross-contamination issues, things like that. We want to keep our, our gray water gray and our black water black. So, uh, Jumping up here, and the reason why I talk about the valves before I talk about this guy here, is this is going to be your black tank flush. Uh, what that does is that corresponds with a jet inside the black water tank, specifically designed to help blast off compounded toilet waste, body waste, things like that. Uh, this is an excellent, excellent feature. It's going to help uh, keep things in better shape longer, keep your sensors clean, uh, keep any compounding on the inside of that tank from happening, things like that. Uh, it does have its own limitations though. So there is no check valve, there's nothing to keep that waste in the tank if you were to overfill that tank with that black water flush. So what that means for you is if you left water running in there uh, indefinitely with this black water valve in the closed position, the path of least resistance is the rooftop septic vents. Um, of course, we're going to want to avoid that. So uh, I'm going to give you three scenarios here of operating the black tank flush with your black water valve here. Uh, those scenarios are going to be if you think that you could possibly forget that you have water running in here, go ahead and open that valve, allow that water just to kind of run through that tank. Uh, of course, that's going to be the, less, the least effective option, uh, but it is going to be your safest option. Uh, second option is going to be keeping the black tank valve in the closed position, allowing water to rush in here for five minutes, uh, no longer than five minutes, and then coming down here and relieving that pressure here. Uh, last, uh, last option is going to be if you have somebody with you, you can, be oper you can have water rushing into this black tank while that person watches the monitor panel on the inside. And when they holler at you, you can go ahead and drain that uh, black tank flush by pulling that towards you. So I didn't cover it, but to open bo either one of these valves, it is just going to be a six inch pull towards you. Um, hopping up here, uh, talking about slide out maintenance and overall structural maintenance. Uh, we're going to want to go on an overall 90 day maintenance schedule with the unit. What that's going to entail specifically for the slide is going to be once every 90 days, we're going to spray these tracks of the Swintec system uh, down with a dry silicone lubricant. So you have tracks top to bottom and left to right. So we have another set of tracks there on the other side of the slide. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to again spray those down with a dry silicone lubricant. We're going to run the slide in and out a, a few times uh, to distribute that lubricant and then we're going to be good for the next 90 days. Um, on that same schedule we're going to use a seal conditioner here on these seals. Now we have seals that wrap fully around the slide on the outside. We also have that same set of seals on the inside. So we have two sets of seals that are going to need condition. Uh, ultimately, you're going to follow the directions on the can to apply that product, uh, but just to give you a feel of what it's going to look like, uh, generally you'll again spray those seals down. You'll let that, you'll allow that uh, product to sit on uh, the seal for a few minutes until it dissipates, maybe wipe off any extra, and then again you're going to be good for the next, uh, for the next 90 days. Uh, 
The tire pressure and lug nuts, tire pressure for this unit is going to be 65 PSI. That's going to be the max tire pressure rating stamped on the sidewall of the tire as well as on this data tag here. So 65 PSI, that's the max tire pressure rating. That's exactly where we want to run the unit. That's going to give us the highest flexibility in terms of weight. So whether we're completely full or completely empty, that 65 PSI is going to be a good number. Uh, lug nuts, also while we're talking about tires, lug nuts have been torqued down to 100 foot-pounds here in the shop. Manufacturer recommends a retorque procedure. The first 15, 25, 50, and 100 miles of initial travel, manufacturer wants you to go ahead and retorque those lug nuts down to 100 foot-pounds. Manufacturer further recommends that uh, at the start of each trip there on after, we do go ahead and make sure those lug nuts are maintaining that 100 foot-pounds of torque. Uh, coming down here, we have your large slide-out compartment here. Uh, biggest thing with that is going to be just use common sense with what you choose to store in there. As far as I know, this does not carry a weight rating from the manufacturer, but I recommend that my customers, again, use common sense. Uh, don't fill it up with bowling balls, rocks, dead bodies, anything like that. Um, you'll want to keep that and just use common sense with that. Uh, coming down here, we have a couple valves further. Um, so let me kind of get on this side of things so you can see. We have your freshwater, uh, freshwater blade X valve here. So to open that again, that's just going to be a six inch pull towards you. That corresponds with a jet, or excuse me, corresponds with a two and a half inch PVC elbow on the back side of that tank. Uh, it takes about a minute to evacuate all 35, 40 gallons uh, of that freshwater from that tank. Uh, and then here we have a similar bayonet style fitting we saw previously and a secondary gray water valve. Uh, what they do on this particular model uh, is they have the kitchen on a separate gray water uh, tank which, which gives you a lot more storage capacity which is nice. Uh, operation is going to be exactly the same. Now behind this wheel, and it's a little hard to see, you have your low point drain. Now those are, and they're just sticking right in front of that axle. Now those are the lowest point in the unit's plumbing. Uh, you have one side for hot, one side for cold. Uh, now you're going to use those to dump the, the point A to point B plumbing. So everything in between water source and fixture is going to be drained via those two uh, lines there. So manufacturer recommends that any time the unit's going to be in storage for more than seven days that we do go ahead and purge all the water from the system. Uh, that's going to look something like this. If, we've, if, the, if the fresh water holding tank has been in use, we're going to go ahead and drain that water. We're going to pull this, give this a six inch pull. We're going to dump all that water. Next, we're going to uh, crawl under there as easy as possible. We're going to go ahead and remove those plugs from those low point drains. That's going to drain all the point A to point B plumbing. Once we've done those two things, the last thing that we need to drain is going to be the water heater. Uh, we haven't gotten to that yet, but I will explain how to do that here in a few minutes. Um, outside shower here, uh, only nothing too crazy about this. And let's see if we have the water pump turned on. It uh, doesn't look like we do. So I can talk you through it. So this has a, a hard on off sprayer here. Uh, what that means is that even though these valves may be on, you're not going to constantly see water here. What I have found is that uh, some people, since they do not constantly see water running here, they forget that they have these valves on. This hose conveniently feeds up into the cabinetry of the unit. Uh, so what that means is that if you have these valves on and you feed this in here like it should, that that on-off switch is going to be orientated towards the door. I have seen where people then go shut this door, it turns that uh, sprayer on, and then they dump some water there onto the inside. So something to be aware of. Just give that a, a kind of a double check that you do in fact have those, uh, that you do in fact have those valves in the off position before stowing that away. Below that we have your fresh water or city water connection. Uh, biggest thing with this is going to be water pressure. So water pressure is very important. This unit can support a working water pressure of 40 to 75 psi. Uh, and we're always going to want to use a water pressure regulator to regulate that pressure. So one is included with the camper. Uh, that water pressure regulator is going to hook directly onto the water source. And then we're going to hook our fresh water drinking hose onto that. 
and then of course ultimately connecting that hose to the trailer here by rotating this trailer bound connection. Uh, again, water pressure is very important. We always want to run with a water pressure regulator. If the one that we included does not uh, provide you with enough pressure, feel free to upgrade that to either an adjustable water pressure regulator or a high flow water pressure regulator. Uh, either way, uh, we just want to make sure we're not exceeding that uh, 75 PSI max water pressure rating. Uh, beside that, we have your cable satellite inlets here. Uh, some higher end campgrounds will provide a park cable service as well as just about every satellite provider is offering a satellite package geared towards RVers. Either way, this is going to be the inlet of those services. This is just a pass-through connection to the designated TV area of the camper. Um, they will either transition again at the TV or on the other side of the camper at that secondary outside TV area. Uh, here we have a 30 amp, 110 volt power supply. This is your cord, comes with the unit. It's 30 feet in length. Only plugs into the unit one way. So as you can see, you have one L-shaped prong there. As long as we line those prongs up correctly, that's going to plug straight in. We're going to give it an eighth inch turn to the right there. That locks it in. Then we do have this secondary collar here to screw down and lock it in further. My number one recommendation I make for any unit that I do deliver is going to be the addition of a 30 amp surge protector. That surge protector is going to plug in as close to the power source as possible and then your cord to that and you're going to be protected all the way through. Number one thing you can do to protect your investment. If you have any further questions on why that's important or how to use a surge protector, feel free to give our parts department a, a call. They would be more than happy to educate you uh, on the importance of a surge protector. Uh, here on the rear of the unit, uh, first up is going to be our uh, Atwood Dometic 6-gallon water heater. Uh, now this is a dual source water heater. What that means is it can run on standalone 110 volt electricity. It can run on propane gas with 12, uh, 12 volt ignition and, uh, or both sources. Now your recharge rates are going to vary dependent on the source. Uh, if you're running on both sources, you're looking at 17 gallons per hour. If you're on standalone propane gas, that's going to be uh, 15 gallons per hour. And if you're running it on 110 volt electricity, that's going to be 11 gallons per hour. Now, manufacturer has two specific recommendations. Uh, number one is going to be draining this water heater separate of the rest of the system. Again, anytime that unit's going to be in storage for more than seven days. The second part of that conversation is going to be uh, when you do start to use the, the water heater again, you need to make sure that you prime it or pump six gallons of water through the system before lighting it up because it's going to be empty, of course, when you start your trip. Uh, so starting with draining it, we're, of course, going to give it ample time to cool down, uh, a lot longer than you may think, uh, three to four hours uh, at least. Once we're fairly certain of the temperature, we do need to depressurize it. So uh, there's a couple options there when it comes to depressurizing it. We can, of course, use the pressure relief valve here and manually uh, relieve that pressure here. Uh, although it may be the most convenient option, it's, it's probably not the safest option or the best option uh, because it, it kind of makes a mess of things down here. Uh, and that water is, is, is under pressure and will kind of hit this windscreen uh, and can splatter back for you. The kind of safer or better option is going to be uh, the using a internal spigot or the hot side of the fixture on the outside shower. Uh, you can use either one of those. So, so kind of to walk you through that, what that's going to look like is you're going to cut off the flow of water to the, the flow of water into the unit. So if that's, if we're running off the uh, potable water tank with the 12 volt water pump, we're going to just turn that water pump switch off. If we are using the city water connection, we're either going to turn the physically turn the spigot off or disconnect the hose from the unit. So once we don't have water, once water is no longer running into the unit, we will then open that hot side of the spigot as well, uh, or fixture, however you want to think about it. And again, you can use that outside shower here. You can use any fixture on the inside, and we're just going to turn that hot side of the spigot that's going to bleed off that excess pressure. Once that pressure has been bled off, we're going to come here with the 15 16 uh, wrench and we're going to back that drain plug out. Now that's a nylon drain plug. It is very important that we keep that a nylon drain plug and we would replace that with anything but a nylon drain plug 
It's going to not only void your warranty with Atwood Dometic, but it is a very important safety function. Uh, the train of thought being is that if this automatic pressure relief valve were to fail uh, and the pressure inside the unit grew to an unsafe amount, it's going to overcome the threads of that drain plug and spit that out like a cork. So it is very important. Um, so once we, um, so once we, we remove that uh, drain plug there, it's going to express the, you know, four to five gallons remaining in the water heater and you're done. So that's it for draining it. Now, when we talk about priming it or feeding water to the unit, uh, it's going to sound very similar. So, uh, of course, we're going to replace the drain plug. We're going to put it back there. Uh, you probably will need some Teflon tape to keep that from leaking. Uh, so once that's in place, we're going to introduce water into the unit. So again, if we're using the, uh, the, the potable water tank in the 12 volt water pump, we're going to flip on that water pump switch. And if we're using that city water connection, we will uh, turn the water on directly on the spigot or hook the hose back onto the, uh, to the unit. But once we have water flowing into the unit, we're again going to use the hot side of any fixture and we're going to turn that on. That flow is initially going to be very bubbly, airy, spitty. Uh, what we're seeing there is all of that water is passing through the water heater here. And ultimately, when you see it at the fixture, it has already been through the water heater. Uh, so once that flow normalizes at the fixture, that is going to be your indicator uh, that you do have six gallons of water into this unit. You can go ahead and turn it on and use it as uh, designed. Uh, also, while we're here talking about the water heater, it is very important that uh, we protect it from the intrusion of mud daubers and flying insects. Uh, they are attracted to the smell of propane, and unfortunately, this, this uh, grating that they have here is, is not uh, sufficient to keep those out. So we're going to uh, use an aftermarket bug screen in place, not only for the water heater here, but for the refrigerator, the furnace, things like that. Uh, again, any propane appliance with the unit we do need to protect from the mud daubers and flying insects and things like that. So we have your rooftop access ladder here. Uh, it's a good point to talk about overall structural maintenance. Now, anywhere on the body where two pieces uh, of the camper come together, they're gonna utilize some sort of sealant. Generally on the body here, you're going to find a 100% silicone product, uh, generally used uh, in conjunction with a butyl uh, product as well. On the roof, we're gonna be looking at something a little different. Lancet generally is a big fan of using a, a butyl-backed roof tape, uh, or you, know, you may even see some self-leveling lap sealing up there. Uh, it is very important that we do inspect, again, anywhere where two pieces come together, and that includes the roof and the body as well. And we're gonna be looking at any degradation in those sealants, any cracks, any gapping, uh, anywhere that looks like you may uh, have any water intrusion issues, uh, we want to catch that as soon as possible and repair as necessary. So uh, sourcing those products, you can of course get any of that stuff from an RV dealer. Uh, you can of course get 100% uh, silicone and possibly butyl at any hardware store. The lap seal and the roof tape there on the roof, you probably are going to have to source that from an RV dealer. But again, once every 90 days, it's very important that we are inspecting the unit because we do want to catch uh, any of those weak points as soon as possible. Um, hood vent here. So this is your kitchen hood vent. Uh, this is a kind of a, this is held closed by a couple latches there. And it's important that we physically open that up before cooking a meal there on the cooktop and ex expecting that uh, hot air to be exhausted. Uh, we do want to make sure we open that up. And then in that same breath, we want to make sure that we close it before uh, finishing up our camping trip. So we want to make sure that's closed before going down the road and open before cooking a meal. Uh, we have the, or our uh, refrigerator vent here, the backside of your refrigerator. Um, not a lot of maintenance uh, that is, is going to be done outside here in this compartment. Uh, I recommend my customers to give it a visual inspection a couple times a year and make sure uh, nothing's gotten in there, make sure everything still looks good. Uh, but uh, most importantly is going to be keeping mud daubers and flying insects out and what we're going to do for that is we are going to further screen these uh, vents off. Uh, again, they sell specifically cut screens for each one of these appliances. Uh, that's going to be the best and easiest option. Now you do have a lower vent and a, a upper vent. 
Uh, make sure we are screening both of those off. Now when putting this vent in place, we want to make sure that your condensation hose is rotted correctly. So we go ahead and stick that through the vent there and then we put the top tabs down first. Top tabs in first, we line up the square holes as best we can. Sometimes you got to fight with it a little bit, but once you have it in there flush, you give those a quarter turn, make sure they're locked on. I like to go ahead and, and double check to make sure it's locked on because that's not something I want to lose going down the road. Uh, so again, give it a visual inspection every 90 days, keep the mud divers flying insects out. All your controls and operation is going to be done from the front side of the refrigerator. Uh, down below that we have your uh, propane burning furnace here. Uh, this is going to be your exhaust. Most importantly, we want to make sure we allow the appliance to exhaust. We're not going to want to restrict that flow. We're not going to want to put anything in front of it. Uh, secondarily, again, to sound like a broken record, we do need to protect this from the intrusion of mud divers and flying insects. We're going to put a screen over that uh, and make sure we are protecting it. Uh, also down here on the rear, we have your uh, tube storage bumper. Uh, this is meant to accommodate your storage hose or any long storage does have a removal cap on each side of that bumper uh, and it works well. Uh, also on this particular unit, I uh, didn't see this at first, but we do have a uh, rear view camera. Now that's a wireless Bluetooth camera that's going to be uh, in operation anytime your marker lights are on. It's going to give you a full time rear view as long as those lights are on. It's going to correspond with a, a monitor panel that will be installed uh, in the cab of your tow vehicle. Uh, coming around here, we have your uh, kind of your, your traditional RV style handrail, which is going to lock in the out position. Some people like to fold it against the camper here. Uh, others like to fold it against the door during transit. Uh, whichever makes sense for you, feel free to use. Now this unit also has keyless entry here on the rear door. Uh, inside your messenger bag with all of your other manuals, you're going to find a single piece of paper to customize this code to your your liking. As it sits right now, your code is 1234, and then you hit the corresponding action. So 1234 lock, 1234 unlock. That is going to actuate that deadbolt here, so keep that in mind. Now this runs on four AA batteries. Probably not a bad idea to keep a, if you're, if you're mainly relying on this, not a bad idea to maybe keep a hide a key on the unit. Uh, again, this may run out of batteries, uh, could potentially leave you locked out. Changing those batteries are going to be done right here on the fixture. So we have these two screws. We're going to remove those. Again, that's four AA batteries. The door handle itself is usually pretty good at letting you know when the batteries are getting low, when enough time to change it. But again, not something that I would necessarily want to bet my lunch on uh, and not have a spare key stash somewhere. Uh, it does also have a uh, little key fob. But again, same, same rule of thumb, not something that, that that technology is not something that I would hang my hat on uh, as my, my you know, sole way of getting inside the unit. Uh, you have an on off switch here. Now that's only going to, uh, that's going to turn on and off the, the ability to use that key fob. And then you have a couple other uh, recess buttons for uh, resetting, the, resetting the door handle uh, to that one, two, three, four code in case you sell the unit down the road or pairing that key fob. So what will happen is that that key fob is eventually going to run out of batteries. When you change those batteries, you are going to need to repair it with the door handle here. Entry steps to fold up and in. And then same on the way out. Uh, we have your potable water fill here. Uh, now that's how we're going to fill that onboard water tank. We're going to stick a garden hose, uh, drinking water hose directly in there. We're going to fill it up to it overflows. Once it's full, we're going to cap it off. We are going to use that onboard 12 volt water pump to draw that water up to the fixtures and make that water usable. For today's presentation, everything you see, if I turn on the water, uh, that is going to be utilizing the water pump and the water tank here. This is going to be a secondary TV area or an outside TV area. On the inside, we're going to find a mount that's going to clip on uh, to this secondary mount here. We're going to install that mount with the top first, then we're going to push the little relief and allow that to overcome here on the, the bottom. The idea is, is that we're going to attach that mount to a secondary TV. We're going to carry that TV with us 
uh, when we're camping, and we're going to install it when we want to watch TV here on the outside. Now, it goes without saying that that TV is only designed to be in place when you are stationary. That TV, of course, isn't going to ride down the road in this location. Uh, depending on the, the TV that you choose to use, you have both power sources, whether that's a 12-volt TV, you have a 12-volt receptacle. If it's a 110-volt TV, we have a 110-volt receptacle there. We also have a couple USBs for charging that's going to make things nice and convenient. Uh, if you are out here enjoying that outside TV to charge any of your other devices you may be using. Uh, very similar do entry door here, although we do not have the, uh, the RV lock, uh, keyless entry lock here, although you could add that. Uh, you can source those from RVLock.com. Uh, you have that same door handle here and same step. We also have a secondary propane, or we have a quick connect propane. Uh, connection there. Now what this does is that ties into your propane and this is going to be utilized for any high flow propane appliance. So whether that's a, a propane fire pit, propane heater, gas grill, any high flow propane appliance is going to be uh, or can be used with this uh, quick connect port here. Now with any quick connect you're going to slide the locking collar back, you're going to insert the male end fully. Once you are fully inserted that's going to snap back and lock into place. If we follow that up a little further, we're going to find a valve. If we go ahead and turn that valve into the inline position, that propane is going to flow. Now, if that, if that valve is in the on position, you cannot connect or disconnect while it is in the on position. We have to go ahead and turn it off, and then that will allow us to connect or disconnect. Now, that is all just covered by this dust uh, cover to keep any road debris or anything like that uh, out of the unit while you're going down the road. So also a little bit further, we have your three quarter inch drive nut. This is a gravity feed spare tire. That spare tire is kept in between the frame rails. It is noted in terms of direction when it comes to uh, raising or lowering that spare tire. Uh, now when it does come to changing the tire on the unit, we're going to of course make sure that the jack that comes with our, uh, <laughs> that jack that comes with our tow vehicle uh, is going to lift the unit high enough to accommodate us changing a tire uh, before we actually need that on the side of the road. So once we are fairly certain that that is going to raise the unit high enough, we're going to put that jack as close, we're going to put that jack on the axle as close to the tire as we can without it interfering in our work. We're going to come here, we're going to drop down the spare tire, we're going to muscle it over there, we're going to change the tire, and then we're going to switch them around, uh, and, and there you go, you have a changed tire. Um, coming here into your, your storage compartment here, this is of course pass-through storage. We saw the other side of this uh, at the start of this presentation. Uh, this tray is fully removable. So if you go to the beach, you get sand in there, you can go ahead and pull that out, rinse it out, uh, do what you need to do with that. Uh, when you're utilizing it, it does need to be locked when you're going down the road. That's going to keep all your gear from slamming into this door. Uh, also in that compartment, we have a a pull-out folding card table. I love this feature. It's, it's like the extra mile that Lance goes uh, to make things very user-friendly uh, and it, it, takes a, it has a zero footprint. So it's, it's an excellent efficient use of space. If you're cooking a meal out here, you, you, you bring that, that card table out, you set it up uh, and you'll be thankful you have it uh, definitely the first time you use it. Uh, also in this compartment we have that same tap light we saw on the other side. Uh, tap the center of the lens that's going to turn it on and off and then a lot of this stuff is going to look very familiar because we have already covered it on the uh, other side of the unit. We have that other side of your battery bank. We have that other these other switches here. Again those are for the stabilizer jacks. Same as the other side just minus the power switch. One thing we didn't talk about on the other side is going to be this solar amp, this solar plug here. Now this is a direct connection to the battery bank. Uh, this is supposed to be used in conjunction with a portable solar panel. Uh, what that means for you is you can very easily plug in uh, the corresponding Anderson plug into this uh, solar plug here. You're going to then take your panel and directionalize it into the, uh, towards the sun, of course. Uh, a lot of those portable panels, they have the charge controllers built directly into the uh, unit itself. So what that means for you is uh, that's going to intake energy as necessary. And it's going to automatically stop taking in that energy when the batteries become full. Uh, essentially this is, this is as easy as you get. 
it is essentially plug and play. You're going to plug that solar panel in and then of course take it out into the yard and set it and forget it essentially. Um, that basically covers it here on the outside. Some things that we didn't talk about like the, the outside speakers, uh, porch light, awning, things like that. We're going to get to the operation of those on the inside. Uh, so we're going to head on the inside and take a look at those features. Coming here into the entry door. Uh, first, let's talk about the door itself. A couple things here that we didn't see there on the uh, outside is you do have that pull down privacy uh, shade, which is nice. Um, that's going to help block out uh, that window, which is nice. We also have your fire extinguisher down low here. That's very important that we do test your safety equipment anytime we're taking the unit out. Uh, what that's going to include is your smoke alarm, your carbon monoxide detector, uh, your LP leak detector and your fire extinguisher. So when it comes to testing this fire extinguisher out, we're going to go ahead and we're going to push that green test tab down. If it springs back, that means we still have life in the unit. We're good to go. If it stays depressed, you go ahead and pull that unit out and you throw it away. Uh, also right here inside the door, we have your uh, main switch clusters here. Uh, all the way here on the right, we have your patio light. Now that's going to be on a three-way switch. Middle's going to be off. Up's going to be a bright white LED. All the way down is going to be an amber colored LED. Uh, we have your awning light switch here. Now since this, uh, these, these uh, the awning lights are on the tube of the awning, we can't see that when it's rolled up. So that's why it's on a lighted switch. If it gets turned on inadvertently, you can see that red light and turn off because it's not being used. Uh, courtesy lights, just a known switch you can hit when you're coming into the door uh, at dark time to go ahead and turn on some lights. Uh, and then we have your slide out mood switch here. That's just going to be the backlighting on the slide there. Uh, we also have your carefree one touch awning beside that. Now that is a true one touch awning. So what that means, we're going to uh, turn on the, the awning switch here and then we're going to hit that uh, in the direction we're trying to go. Now it is very important that we do make sure both these doors are in the closed position. That's, that's extremely important. That awning rail will get caught uh, on those doors. Uh, when operating this awning, uh, in the event that uh, something may possibly like jump out in front of you or um, you need to stop that awning quickly, uh, you're going to hit it a second time in the direction you're going. So if you're extending, and something comes up, you're going to hit it and extend just one time. Just hit it one time. That on is going to stop immediately. From there, you could then hit retract. It's going to bring it back in. Now, this one touch awning is also equipped with wind protection. What that means for you is as long as this switch is in that on position, if a gust of wind comes and shakes that uh, awning violently, it's going to go ahead and automatically retract. Now, that's not something that I would bet my lunch on, so to speak. Uh, we kind of talked about that with this door handle. Uh, anytime you are leaving the unit unattended, that awning needs to be brought in. It's a very expensive awning. I would not uh, trust this bit of technology uh, with that awning. Turning around, we have your refrigerator here. Uh, these uh, door handles have the, the actual latches on the side of it. So we uh, hold that and we go ahead and open it. Uh, same with the fridge. Our eyebrow pad is going to be directly in between the freezer and the refrigerator. And what we have there, it's very simple to navigate. We have an on off switch. We go ahead and turn it on. It's going to go through like a boot up procedure. And then we have a single mode button. So our, this is a two way refrigerator. So what that means is it runs on 110 volt electricity or propane gas. Now, if we're on this auto side, which is going to be the first selection, if uh, it's going to default to AC voltage first, if it does not find AC voltage, it's going to automatically start lighting on gas. If I hit that mode button one more time, it's going to automatically throw it into propane. That's going to be your going down the road option. Your boondocking option is going to be propane gas. Uh, next up is going to be temperature set. We have three selections there, kind of a low, medium, and high. The, it is labeled coldest is going to be further, furthest to the right. Uh, other than that, uh, nothing too crazy. Uh, it does take about 24 hours to get down to temperature, so it is a, a very popular option to kind of pre-cool that refrigerator the night before. Uh, slide in and out switch here. Now, it is very important that we operate this slide out correctly. It's going to be fully in, fully out. Uh, avoid short bursts. Now, the Schwintech system is two independently geared motors, so what that means if we 
uh, do short bursts or, or partial openings, things like that. It can actually throw those independent, those, those motors off and it will actually bind the slide in its opening. So come fully in, go fully out. Hold the switch until the motor stops. So there's an electric brake on that motor. You will be very, will be very clear when that uh, slide out is either in or out, fully in or out, so that you'll know when to take your finger off the button. Uh, coming around here to the corner, first up we have your soffit lights, which are just going to be these lights here above our heads. Uh, and then up above that we have your, your, your convenience center, courtesy panel, micro monitor, it goes by multiple different names. They all pretty much function the same. Uh, you have a series of lights that correspond with the level of full. So the more lights you see, the fuller the specific tank and or battery you're testing is. So uh, if we look at those indicators on the left is going to be your battery voltage. And this particular one goes by, uh, by, by the volt. So you have 12.3, 11.7, 11.2 and low. And then on the right there, we have empty one thirds, two thirds full. And that's talking about the tanks. So you go ahead and you push the button. Uh, in this case, we're testing the battery and battery is reading full. Now, battery is always going to read full anytime you're plugged into shore power to get a true readout of where that battery sits. You need to unplug from shore power and then go ahead and test the battery uh, there. Uh, fresh water is going to be two thirds full. Again, for today's presentation, if we do, do any running of water, we're going to be drawing that from the fresh water tank utilizing the 12 volt water pump. Uh, black tank is empty, gray water empty, gray water empty. So we have two gray water tanks. Um, one and two. Uh, next up, we have your water heater switches. Now we have, again, we can run both sources there. Electric is going to be the one on the bottom. Gas is going to be right there in the middle. Uh, we can run them independently, uh, gas and then electric. Now, one thing to bring up worth noting, uh, is going to be this DSI fault light here. Now, uh, the way that these water heaters work, they cycle three times or they try and light three times. If they do not light by the end of that third, by the end of that third cycle, they're going to stop trying to light, uh, and they're going to illuminate this DSI fault light. Uh, what that simply means is your water heater did not light. So generally, it's because of, of a few things, but uh, either your your propane valves up top on the tank are closed, uh, either you don't have any gas in the tank itself, or because the water heater is at the back of the unit and the Propane's at the front of the unit uh, may just not have had enough time to make its way back to the water heater uh, before uh, it cycled three times. In the event that that happens, try and correct the issue. Um, you know, check and make sure you have propane in the bottle, make sure that valve's on. Then come here and just turn that switch off, turn it back on. It's going to cycle another three times. Uh, and then lastly on that panel, we have your water pump switch. Again, for today's presentation, that's how we're going to be operating the unit. Is with that 12 volt water pump. Uh, coming here into the kitchen area, we have your hood light and hood vent, very typical stuff uh, that you would see. Uh, your cooktop is going to be uh, a, it has a piezo igniter here. We're going to turn to light and then we're gonna spark that. That's gonna light the burner from there. We can go ahead and choose the uh, intensity of our flame there. We're gonna light the oven slightly different. Uh, we're going to have to light a pilot light uh, how we're going to do that is we're going to turn this to pilot. We're going to go ahead and hold that button in. While we're holding that button in, we're going to take our long stem barbecue lighter and we're going to put our flame right there on, in between those two prongs uh, while holding that pilot light until we see a flame. Once we see a flame, we're going to hold that uh, knob in for a few more seconds so that thermal coupler has time to heat up. Then we're going to go ahead and turn that to the degree uh, that we're aiming for. Uh, up top there, we have your high point microwave. Now that is a pretty standard microwave. Uh, not going to be much different than what you're used to running uh, at your house. Only difference is, is there is no turntable. So it does cook just as well without a turntable. Um, and operation is going to be the exact same. We have your main GFI outlet here. Uh, that's going to be the reset point uh, for your receptacles. All of these receptacles are on the same circuit. If one of them gets overloaded, they all follow suit. If you do not see that, that green light there on the outlet, that means that they have been overloaded 
and you need to press that red button to reset them. Uh, in the kitchen area here, um, gonna remove these countertop extenders. Uh, you have your different spray modes there on the uh, fixture as well as that pull down. Back here you have a uh, cool little trash can there. You can pull that out, uh, rinse out, clean as necessary. Behind this panel here, uh, there's four screws. Behind that panel, you're going to find the backside of your water heater. Uh, for bypass perp or for, for winterization purposes, it's, it's important that we bypass that water heater. You're going to find a yellow tag back there. We're going to follow the directions of that tag to bypass the water heater. It's important that we bypass that water heater before introducing antifreeze into the system uh, because we don't want to fill that water heater with the antifreeze. Uh, water pump is going to be underneath the couch here and we are going to uh, use the vacuum line of that water pump to introduce that. Uh, I guess it's a good time to demo the jackknife sofa uh, here. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to lift from the, the bottom and kind of pull out and allow that to uh, fold down flat. Now underneath here and hopefully I'm not mistaken. Oh, there it is. So water pump is on the underside here. Uh, now, uh, what you have here is you have a, this clear line is gonna be a vacuum line. If we trace this clear line back, uh, you're going to see a black valve on the other side of that. We're gonna turn that valve in line with this clear hose. And once we have done so, uh, we're gonna go ahead and stick this into a bottle of RV grade antifreeze. So once we go ahead and stick this into the antifreeze, uh, from there, of course, we have already bypassed the water heater and we have purged all the water from the unit. So it's very important that we do those. I, it, the order would actually be dumping the water from the unit, then bypassing the water heater, then coming here and doing this. So with that valve in line and this in a, a gallon of antifreeze, we are then going to um, turn on our water pump. We're going to go from fixture to fixture within the units. That's the kitchen sink, the kitchen sink, the bathroom sink, the shower, the toilet. Um, that's it here on the inside. Outside, it's just going to be the outside shower. We're going to go ahead and we're going to run both sides of each of those fixtures, so the hot and the cold, until we actually see that antifreeze come to the fixture. We're going to give it a few seconds on the way out um, to allow that to fill any P traps on the way out and then we would be fully winterized there. When we're done uh, introducing that antifreeze to the system, we wanna make sure we return that valve to that uh, normal working position. Um, also, other than being a jackknife sofa, other than being a jackknife sofa, it also does have recliners on each side. So you have the, the side switch here. Uh, now these recliners lock in that out position. So what that means is, uh, most commonly with a recliner, you would push from the top to, to put them in. With these particular ones, you're going to use the heel of your foot and push from the outside down. And that goes for both of them there. Above my head, we have a, a little vent. Uh, there is no fan or exhaust fan here. Now, this does come pre-wired. So at the later date, if you want to go ahead and add a 12-volt uh, fan to this, you can do so. Uh, down on the floor, we have our secondary piece of safety equipment. That's going to be your carbon monoxide LP leak detector. That's wired into the 12 volt section of the camper. So it kind of secondarily functions as a low battery alarm. It does have a test button on it, and it will let you know which of those gases it is sensing uh, by the series of lights on the unit itself. Uh, coming over here to the dinette, uh, you have these lockable drawers on each side of the dinette. Uh, it's very important that we do make sure they're unlocked fully before we pull on them. So make sure that uh, knob is in the out position, and then that will allow you to go ahead and pull that out. When it's locked in there, it's locked in there. When that, that knob is down, it's locked in there. Dinette, here we have your pedestal style table. Uh, this does make a secondary sleeping area. So what that's going to look like is we would uh, wrestle the tabletop from the pole here. We then remove that pole from the flange on the floor. Uh, then we take that tabletop, we move these cushions out slightly, and we put them here on these rails here. Now with that tabletop in place, we're gonna go ahead and remove this back cushion here, the short back cushion. Uh, from there, we're gonna take these two side cushions, we're gonna lay them out. That's going to go ahead and make out your secondary sleeping area or um, you know, your dinette sleeping area there. 
uh, lights here. You have a hard on off light on the actual fixture. And then you also have a dimmer here as well. Um, you know, set those mood lights. So we have your projector style shades here. Uh, these are going to come down and they'll stay in that down position. Uh, this is going to let some light through. This is going to be your essentially your blackout shade there. So you're going to pull down uh, till it stops. And then when you're when you're putting it up, you're going to give it a slight tug. That's going to allow that to come up. Same with that. Now, all these windows are going to open different than the emergency exit window. Uh, what that means for you is you fold out this tab here and that will allow you to go ahead and crank that window to that out position. Same on the way in. And then once we're fully in, we fold that tab back in. Uh, that does go for all of the windows, even here uh, in the dinette, everything except for that emergency exit window. Um, bringing us here to the TV area. And now what you're gonna pay special attention to is if you stick your hand back here, there is a little black ribbon. So we're gonna pull on that ribbon that's going to unlock the uh, television. Now it is very important uh, that you make sure this TV is uh, back in its place before bringing in that slide. So that slide stops for no one. It's gonna rip that TV right off the wall. So we do wanna make sure that it is uh, placed all the way back. Uh, now we're gonna move this TV out of the way for a, for a second. We're gonna pay attention to these uh, plates here. Uh, starting from the top, we have your 110 volt, uh, 110 volt, uh, 15 amp outlets. Uh, below that, we have a 12 volt uh, outlet. That one's being utilized by the TV since it is a 12 volt TV. Now down the road, if you don't want to use a 12 volt TV, you can go ahead and use those 110 volt outlets. That's why they put them there. Uh, below that, we have your antenna booster. And a little hard to see, but right where my finger is, there's a little button that's going to turn that uh, light on and off. What that's doing is that is sending power to your antenna. Uh, we're going to just kind of focus on that. But here in just a minute, we're going to walk over here by the door and talk about that antenna. Just keep in mind that that antenna gets its power from that booster there. And then below that, we have a couple HDMI uh, ports. What you see there is essentially just a junction point uh, that is connecting your Jensen unit down here uh, to the actual the TV. Now your Jensen unit here is gonna be a CD, DVD, AM, FM radio, Bluetooth, all of those features are gonna be utilized through this unit itself. Um, I find most people are pretty easily, to, it's pretty easy to work around this. Uh, you have your mode button here that's gonna take you through the modes. You have AM, FM, Bluetooth, uh, auxiliary, uh, HDMI arc, and so on and so forth. Uh, Bluetooth pairing button here. Uh, you have uh, your seek and your find there. You have uh, your zones there. Uh, very important to talk about zones. So uh, A is gonna be in this room here, uh, these two speakers above our heads. B is gonna be the speakers in the bedroom, and C is gonna be the outside speakers you control uh, each zone separately and uh, again you want to make sure that you when you have zone C out zone C on specifically that you are purposely uh, playing your music there on the outside so um, other than that again it has its own uh, has its own service manual has its own remote is very pretty straightforward um, to work around that and now hopping over here to your antenna now this is your king jack antenna uh, we talked about how this gets its power from the antenna booster, but as you see, it does have an on off switch here on the actual unit. Now what this is, uh, is your signal indicator. That on off switch is just turning that signal indicator off. If somebody was sleeping out here, uh, they may find those bright blue and red lights. Uh, uh, they may find those troublesome. So uh, what you have here is an always up antenna. What I would be doing here is rotating it to get a better signal. So once I see as many lights as possible, I'm then going to go do a channel search on the television. That's going to bring in my best choice uh, when it does come to digital over the air or digital over the air television. Now we do have an attenuator here. Uh, I can't think of a, a scenario where you may want less signal, but uh, you could uh, and you you can control that. Uh, again, doesn't have a travel position. It is always up. You don't have to crank it down or anything like that. Um, Keep that in mind. Uh, up top here, we have your 
uh, skylights with your uh, pull shade there. And um, also, let me find a light here that's not on your switch there, which if we come here into the uh, hallway of the unit, you can kind of see the rest of the lights that aren't going to be on that common switch are going to have a switch right there on the actual fixture. So that's how you're going to turn those on and off. Uh, making sure we didn't miss anything here. I think we're good to move on. Uh, coming here on, we'll, we'll talk about this kitchen area here if you want to come this way and then we'll open up that bathroom door and go over the stuff in the bathroom. So we have just your standard like medicine cabinet kind of stuff, uh, on off switch there on the mirror, uh, hot and cold there on the fixture. Uh, you also have a countertop extender here. Uh, very important that you operate these uh, correctly because this does lock in that out position. So you do want to kind of lift up on that. So you lift up that freeze it and then you kind of push there in the middle uh, and that will allow that to come down. Uh, towel hanger, storage, stuff like that. Uh, we have your thermostat here. Uh, now, this is going to be a one single mode button thermostat. So it's going to be off when you start. It's going to give you a real time uh, temperature on the inside of the unit. We're going to push that. Uh, that's going to kick us into the fan speed. So we have low fan, we have high fan, we have cool high and cool low. So if we're on either low or high there, that's going to be an always on fan. So that, what that means is that fan's going to run indefinitely whether it reaches this temperature or not. So kind of get that to, to communicate with us completely. We need to keep that in auto. What that means is in, if we're, we choose either a high or a low fan speed, and as long as, as, long, as, long as we're in auto, uh, that fan's going to reach a specific temperature and then shut off. Now, if I keep going through those modes, it's going to take us into that heat mode. Uh, what that means is, is once this realizes what I'm doing, it's going to kick off that, that air conditioner fan. It's going to kick on that blower motor to that furnace immediately. Uh, 16 seconds after that, it actually ignites. By that 30 second mark, it's produced a noticeable heat. Uh, within the first 15 minutes of operation, if it does go ahead and set off that smoke alarm, that's totally common. Uh, there's no issues. It is just inherent of the appliance. Uh, it does get more efficient as it burns. So again, within the first 15 minutes of operation, you should almost be expected that it's going to go ahead and, 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 uh, and uh, set off that smoke alarm. So coming here into the bathroom, I'm not going to blow your mind with anything here in the bathroom. This is all very kind of standard stuff. Um, we, of course, have your adjustable uh, shower head here uh, where you can push this button and slide that up or down uh, on that pole. Uh, shower head's going to have uh, different spray modes, but ultimately an off switch. Uh, that way you can go ahead and, and you'll probably find yourself conserving that six gallons of hot water as much as possible. What that means for you is you're probably going to do like a military or Navy style shower uh, where you're going to, um, you know, like soap up and then turn the water off uh, and then turn it back on when you're ready to rinse, things like that. Uh, allows you to conserve your water without uh, changing the valve, uh, the mix here. Uh, you have a porcelain toilet with a pedestal flush on it. It's going to be a light press to fill up the bowl. It'll be a full press to flush. You always want to keep some water in the toilet. That's going to help keep the bad smells down. Uh, goes without saying, you do need to use a single ply RV grade toilet paper as well as a chemical toilet treatment. If you do have any questions on which products to use, uh, feel free to go ahead and uh, contact our parts department. They would be happy to educate you with that. Uh, light switch here, uh, which is just going to control the ceiling lights. And then we do have a little 12 volt exhaust fan here that has its own separate switch. Uh, very important that we do go ahead and close this uh, before going down the road. Uh, other than that, I mean, you have some storage here. You have your toilet paper roll, towel holder, things like that. Uh, but are pretty, pretty basic kind of, kind of straightforward stuff. Uh, closet here. Um, hanging storage in there uh, it's a large closet uh, with a fair amount of room in there so, um, secondary entry door here that's going to lead us right into the bedroom 
A lot of the things that we've already, a lot of things that are already present uh, in the unit are going to stay, uh, carry through here into the bedroom. Uh, we have uh, under bed storage, which is nice. Um, so you do have that uh, storage there on the underside, uh, which is a very efficient use of uh, space. Uh, we have those soft closed drawers uh, throughout the camper. Uh, on each side of the bed, we have a couple 110 volt outlets. And then on this side, we have a charging section, which is going to have a couple USBs, uh, as well as a cigarette lighter style 12 volt receptacle. Uh, more hanging storage on each side of the bed. These are each going to have a hanging rail there. Uh, and then we have your reading lights here. So switch for those lights is going to be directly on the fixture. Uh, we have a fantastic fan above my head here. This one's equipped with a thermostat. So uh, of course you would crank it open to use it. We're going to choose a speed. And then if we choose a thermostat here, what that's going to do is that's going to kick on and off to maintain that temperature. It's a very nice feature. Uh, we also have a four amp fuse holder here that's going to utilize a bus style fuse. Um, doesn't burn out very often, but if you do have any issues with that, I would, I would check that first. Uh, again, very important that we do make sure we close this before going down the road. I want to make sure that's closed and tight. Um, light switches, all the lights in the bedroom are right there on the fixture. We already kind of touched base on those. Uh, the back lighting is going to be that switch there on that side of the bed. So you have one single switch that's going to control the back lighting here uh, on the front window. We have a secondary TV area here with it already has the uh, screws for the mount installed. So you just got to get a TV and a TV mount and then you can tie into those uh, systems that we've already talked about throughout the unit. Uh, and then we have a slightly different pull down uh, window here. So you have that privacy there and that would be your, uh, that would allow some light there in uh, as well. And then of course we have the full open window. Um, that just about covers it here on the inside of the unit. If you have any questions or concerns, uh, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this walkthrough of the 2285.